Unmoved by the loud agitation for the power shift to the South in the 2023 presidential election, the main opposition People's Democratic Party, PDP, said yesterday that it will open up the contest for its presidential ticket to the six geopolitical zones in the country. The PDP made its position known when it received members of the Northern Advocates for Good Governance, an umbrella pressure group of the 19 northern states rooting for the zoning of the presidential ticket to the north. Speaking on behalf of the party's chairman, the Deputy National Publicity Secretary of the PDP, Abdullahi Ibrahim, erroneously averred that from 1999 to 2023, the South will have ruled Nigeria for 14 years, while the North has done so for 10 years, as opposed to 11 years. Until his death, in May 2020, the late President Umaru Yaradwa was in office for three full years, not two years. Ibrahim also deliberately left out the incontrovertible fact that of Nigeria's 62 years since independence, the North has ruled cumulatively for 41 years and six months, while the South has held power for 20 years and six months. Joining us now to continue the debate on this hot-button issue and the position taken by the PDP is Dr. Okwesilieze Wodo, former governor of Enugu State and national chairman of the People's Democratic Party in 2020, 2010. Good morning, Dr. Wodo, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Ruben. Happy to be with you this morning. Morning, sir. Well, very quickly, what do you make of this uh, latest uh, disclosure? That the uh, PDP now wants to create uh, a level playing field to accommodate everybody from the uh, six geopolitical zones in terms of the presidential contest in 2023. Whereas, it's the same PDP, uh, you, you are one of the leaders of the party, uh, that introduced this idea of zoning to promote equity, justice, and inclusiveness. Has the party really taken that decision, or this is just some people pursuing their own personal narrow interests? Well, thank you, Ruben, for this question. What I can tell you uh, is that as we speak now, the PDP has not taken a position on where the president uh, will come from in, uh, with regards to our nomination. You will recall that when we did our last national convention, we zoned just for the party offices, and we didn't zone for the elective offices at the executive level. Now, we are still going to have to set up a zoning committee when we get to that stage to look at the zoning. What is happening now is that every group that wishes to present a presidential candidate is making their case. Our constitution permits for this. Our constitution says there should be zoning and rotation of political offices, clearly written in our constitution. And we have obeyed it to a large extent since PDP was formed. Now, if we cast our minds back, Ruben, uh, during the Abacha regime, there was a constitutional conference, 1995. And if you look at the draft constitution that was produced at that conference, on chapter 209, on page 109, uh, you will see where it is clearly written that there will be rotation between the North and the South. That draft constitution also contained that there will be two vice presidents. Now, if these provisions were not taken out when the 1999 constitution was written, there would have been no need for doctrine of necessity because the vice president from the zone that the president came from would have stepped in as the president. You can see what happened recently in our own crisis in PDP when Uche Secondus was removed. 
the vice chairman from his zone, from the south, stepped in as the acting chairman. Secondly, if we had captured this rotation in the constitution, then we will not be in this debate we are doing today because it would have been a constitutional matter, signed, sealed, and delivered. Indeed, I remember very clearly at that time, the position of PDP was that the presidency should be a single term of, of five years and that it, uh, of six years, and it should rotate amongst the uh, six geopolitical zones. Now, if we had adopted that rotation and a single term, within 30, 36 years, if it's five years or six years tenure, every zone would have tested the presidency. Then we can safely say that we can go into merit wherever the president comes from, as long as is driven by merit. Nigerians will choose the best of those who are aspiring. But we have missed these opportunities, and that's why we're in this colundrum and quagmire today. But I believe that the tradition that has been set in place where we are all agreed that the presidency should rotate between the north and the south, the arguments that are being made now are just arguments that are being made by people who do not want to face the truth. Yes, we have a sitting president from the north, soon to complete eight years. Ruben, is it fair that the north will continue for another eight years? Definitely not. Now, what happened when Umaru Yaradua died? was not contrived by anybody. It was not even foreseen by our constitution. That's why we had to fall into the doctrine of necessity. But having done that and solved that situation, we should continue with our north-south rotation of the presidency for unity, for fairness, for equity in our country. Well, since the argument is on the table, Everybody can manufacture his own reasons why it should be zoned to him or why it should be thrown open. But when we come to it, I will also present very, very convincing and strong reasons why this should go to the southeast and not any other place. Thank you, sir. So was the emergence of the national chairman of the PDP, Iyocha Ayu, something of a red herring, because that tended to point to the fact that PDP would go southwards when looking for their presidential candidate. What do you make of that? And what will happen in the event that PDP does choose a southern presidential candidate? Well, if PDP chooses a southern presidential candidate, I believe that, one, it will cut out PDP, as we have always been cut out, as a party that believes in fairness, equity, and justice, and above all, the unity of this country. We have had two PDP pres presidents in Nigeria, and during their tenure, there was no agitation for separation of Nigeria. During their tenure, there was no accusation of marginalization of any part of Nigeria. So I believe that if we present a southern candidate again, that policy will continue to be central in the administration of PDP. Secondly, I also believe that there is a clamor right now. And leaders must listen to the people that they are ruling. There's a clamor for Southern presidency. And this clamor is not dropping from the blues. It's dropping because that is the right way to go. And that's why Southern Nigeria is arguing, insisting, trying to convince everybody that that is the right way to go. Unless we want to foster the, what is going on in Nigeria today, the division along tribes, along religion, 
the agitation for people to leave the, the country, and insecurity that comes with all of that. I don't think that is what everybody should be gunning for. We should be convinced that there is only one way that justice can be rendered on this matter. And once we follow that way, it will reunite our country. It will bring us back from the precipice. And therefore, this is not a time for people to be parochial. It is not a time for people to put selfish ambition over and above national unity. I think it's a time for sacrifice. It's a time to reunite our country from where we have been driven in the past six going to seven years. People must be conscious that there is only one way that this can be done. I don't know why it is difficult to convince our fellow countrymen that this time it is important to do justice to southern Nigeria and not to continue with a northern presidential uh, candidate after 2023. Well, let me ask, uh, after the PDP lost the uh, election, the presidential election in 2015 and again in 2019, the big question has been, has the PDP learned any lessons? I recall a committee was set up to re review whatever happened. But in the context of what is going on, can we really say that the PDP has learned from the mistakes it made in the past? And if you look at uh, the contenders from the north within the PDP, uh, Alaji Atiku Abubakar, uh, Dr. Bukola Saraki from uh, North Central, um, Governor Aminu Tambuwal of uh, Sokoto State, Senator Rabi Ukwankwanso from Kano, uh, also um, uh, Governor Bala Muhammad of Bauchi State, who says, look, is a turn of the uh, Northeast. Do you, are you really convinced that uh, the PDP would eventually decide that maybe the South should present a candidate? And if it is uh, so decided, uh, is the South is really sure uh, that both the South South and the Southwest will just yield the field to the South East? I'm very happy with this question, Ruben. Let, let me approach it this way. South is for going to 60 years, has patiently waited since after the Civil War for this justice to be done. And in all of this, during the, 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 the election of Shehu Shagari, we voted in the Southeast massively for the MPN. During the time of Ulusegu of Basanjo. The Southeast, again, in spite of the fact that the PDP was engineered by Dr. Alex Ekweme, when he, a majority of the contestants from the East, lost in the primary in Jos, we again voted massively for a candidate from the Southwest. When it was the turn of Yaradua, a lot of candidates came from Eastern Nigeria. Pito Dili, Achiku Denwa, um, Sam uh, uh, Egu, Donald Duke, and so on and so forth. But when they all lost to Yaradua, the Southeast voted massively for the PDP. So, as we speak now, if the South is, is given the ticket, why will the, all the sections of Nigeria that we have been voting massively for in the PDP now take their vote and they are PDP members and supporters all these years and go and give it to somebody else because South is, is not part of Nigeria? Is that the case that should be made? And it is a just case. It is a transparent case. It is a case for unity of Nigeria. What has the South East actually done to merit all of this? Is it that we lack people that can rule Nigeria? Or is there a crime we have committed 
that this punishment is not yet over? I think our countrymen should have a conscience. And I believe that this country has a conscience. Yes, there was injustice in June 12. This next opportunity that came up after Abacha sustained June 12, and when he left office, the next, the, uh, the, the next election, justice was done to the people of Southwest. PDP nominated Rusego Basanjo. Even though Obonyanu had won the nomination in the opposition party, he had to yield to Lufalaye. This country has a conscience. We don't know why that conscience takes a flight when it comes to the Southeast. We think that we need that conscience to wake up. And we need all right-thinking people of Nigeria who want to heal the wounds of yesterday, who wants us to march together in unity and develop our country to yield this position at this time in all parties to the Southeast. All right, thank you, sir. Let's talk about specifics. Let's talk about those from the Southeast, from your party, who have thrown their hats into the ring. You have the former SGF and Senate President, Anim Pius Anim, and you have the renowned pharmacist and businessman, Mazi Sam Ohambua. Let's talk about their prospects and also the feelings, the thoughts of that important you know, power block, the Southern governors, some of whom are from PDP. You have most vocal of them, Governors Wiki and Governors Emmanuel from Akwaibom and River State. But you have all the PDP governors who joined the, their fellow Southern governors and signed a communique requesting, calling for, demanding a Southern president. Is that power block going to be silenced by these Northern contenders? Well, as I said, <clears throat> we are all fighting for the soul of Nigeria. And it will, be, it will be sad that that soul of our country is bastardized at this time. We believe that this, this is an unusual happening. This is an unusual happening for governors of southern Nigeria from different political parties and different tribes to come in unison and say that the presidency should be zoned to southern Nigeria. I don't think that this demand is something that should be taken for granted, that it's not a serious matter. It is indeed a very serious matter. And there are strong reasons why they came to that conclusion. They didn't just come to it just to play politics or to play to the gallery. They came to it out of conviction, out of tradition of what has been happening in our country. And why must we change the goalposts at the middle of the game? We don't have to. It's not done. This status quo has to remain because it has united this country so far. Why do we want to dash it to the rocks now that our unity is standing on a thin thread? I don't think this is the right time for us to rock the boat. People's mm. personal ambition can never be stronger than a united national ambition. All Nigerians have to come together to build this country. No one section can build it alone. We need all hands on deck. And that's why we are being extremely passionate and we are pleading, we are trying to get the conscience of our country to do the right thing. I believe that if the presidency is zoned to the south, and the two parties nominate their candidates from the South, the country would definitely find 
a credible presidential candidate to vote for that will re re reunite our country. And then together, we can now rebuild our country. Well, sir, the point that was made by uh, the Northern Leaders of Thought, uh, the Northern Elders Forum, and the Coalition of Northern Groups is that the Southeast, the groups in Southeast, political leaders in the Southeast, uh, carry on as if uh, uh, the uh, president of uh, Southeastern Extraction will be a president of uh, Ibus rather than the president of Nigeria. And they think that that's some kind of blackmail uh, that is unacceptable to them. They met recently at Arewa House uh, in January. Uh, so that, that's their position. They're saying, yes, they, be, they believe in equity and justice and all of that, but that Igbos cannot blackmail the rest of Nigeria into saying the uh, position should be given to them on a platter of gold. But I wanted uh, to go back to the point raised by uh, Tundo. Tundo identified two major uh, persons from the Southeast who have indicated uh, interest. So I'll piggyback on that and vary it and say, well, if the Southeast were to put forward persons, who are those persons you would recommend from the Southeast? either in the PDP or APC or whatever platform, because we have quite a number of persons of Southeast extraction who are interested in leading Nigeria. Okay, let me start from, from the second question. For Nigeria to choose a candidate as president at this time, there are qualities Nigerians should be looking for. Wherever the president is going to come from, there are qualities we must be looking for. The first quality is we need a president who can comprehend the present colundrum in Nigeria and who has a clear vision of how to solve the situation in Nigeria today. He must be a candidate that has clear economic roadmap to remove us from the point of the poorest nation in the world back to the economy that is growing fastest in Africa and back to the economy that was the number seven strongest economy growing in the world. That candidate must have a solution to unemployment. We need a candidate who has integrity. A candidate who has integrity, integrity, integrity. Not one that will fall on the knife of EFCC. It must be somebody in his lifestyle has put service before wealth. We need a candidate who has the capacity to communicate. He must have a great communication skill in order to articulate our problems and our solutions in order to carry us along. We need a candidate who is educated who can comprehend the different problems that are facing Nigeria and be able to collate ideas, synthesize them, and find the solution. This is the kind of candidate we are looking for. It must be a candidate also that on his feet can answer this insecurity problem in Nigeria and in the region of West Africa. We need a candidate who, at the same time, must also have a vision of harnessing our internal resources, which God has blessed us abundantly. The other day I was looking at, at, at my diary, and I was looking at the minerals in each of the 36 states and FCT in Nigeria. And I said to myself, I don't see why any Nigerian should go to bed hungry. If we have a political structure 
like we had at Independence, where each region was harnessing these potentials, low-hanging fruits that created wealth with which they advanced the development of their various regions. Now, having mentioned some of what we are looking for, let me just give you names in the Southeast, not in any other, but people that I know by the antecedents and by the criteria I have mentioned have the capacity to lead Nigeria. Ngozi Okonje Iwala is leading the world at the World Trade Conference. In Nigeria, she was in charge of various ministries coordinating the economy of this country. She was a minister for finance. And in these portfolios, she got us debt relief. She moved the economy to be number one in Africa. She moved the economy to be number seven in the world. Or are you telling me that in Africa we're not ready for a female president? You talked about Sam Uwabonwa. Sam was the leader of the economic summit. At the time, government listened to the economic summit and made use of their suggestions that saw our economy growing. He has been in the manufacturing sector. He has led the pharmaceutical industry in this country. You mentioned uh, 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 Anyem, who was Senate president and secretary to the federal government. Does he not have enough exposure? What about John Nianwood, who has been federal minister multiple times and who led Ohanese creditably? What about Dr. Obonia Ono? This is a PhD in engineering, former governor, former chairman of party, long time serving minister. You tell me he doesn't have the capacity to rule Nigeria? What about Peter Obi? Governor Peter Obi is the first governor in Nigeria who, on leaving office, left monumental resources, both in fixed deposits and investment and in cash, for his successor. Until today, nobody has traced. 10 Naira of uh, uh, an Ambra state that wrongly went into his pocket. Extremely successful businessman and has gone to all the business schools in the world to improve his grasp of entrepreneurship and economic development. You tell me he cannot rule Nigeria? I can go on and on. We have materials. We have people who have demonstrated transparency in governance, in business, and who have credible ideas on how to take us from our colondrum. Why can't we turn to the Southeast for God's sake? What is the crime of Southeast? What have we done that Nigeria cannot forgive? I don't understand what's going on. But I believe, as I said before, Nigeria has a conscience. And we are here to prick that conscience. To wake it up as it has been done in the past. In order to heal the wounds of June 12. Today, with what is going on in the Northeast, we have set up a Northeast Economic Development Commission. When the South South protested that it was the hand that laid the golden egg, 
and they wanted resource control. President Jaradua healed the wounds. We have created a Niger Delta ministry. We have created a company that is targeted to improving and fast forwarding the development in the Niger Delta. We have created opportunities for their youths. Why is it that when we come to the South, the story changes? The conscience of this country takes a flight. We said at the end of the war, no victor, no vanquished. Reconciliation, reconstruction, and what have you. All delivered in the breach. For years, it was anathema for anybody from Southeast to dream of heading any of the arms of the military or the police or to be the Minister for Finance. There were no go areas we endured. We didn't complain. I think that Nigeria owes the South is a lot. We are the first that should have been given a zonal economic commission. Today we don't have it. Today our youths are despondent. Our youths are going into depression, into drugs, into agitation for freedom they cannot find in our country. And nobody wants to reach out to them. Nobody wants to listen to them. Instead, they are labeled as terrorists for wanting a level playing ground in their country. Indeed, sir. Is it right? Well, a lot of what you described in your portrait of the ideal candidate actually reminded me of President Muhammadu Buhari when he was the candidate. Muhammadu Buhari, he was the model, is the model of the fine, upstanding, uncorruptible Nigerian general. But we can see now some of those expectations have not been met. So it leads me to my question. So much emphasis, so much focus is on one person, the president. What about the systemic issues? What about the kind of structure? What about the foundational issues? What do you think the next president of Nigeria, whoever that might be, should do to address that? Because no matter who the president is, even if he's like the archangel from heaven, there's only so much one individual can do in a system such as this. That is very important. And if you listen to me, maybe I should make it clearer now. We need a president who will look at the political and economic structure of our country. There is no way, there is no way we can sustain 36 states and FCT with a, a feeding bottle that is running empty. It's not possible. But if we create six or more centers of development, harnessing the agricultural, mineral, and intellectual resources of this country, we will grow an economy that was equivalent to what Dr. M. I. Okpara did in the First Republic. Eastern region was the fastest growing economy in the entire world. The things that made it so are still there. They have not disappeared. The palm oil, the palm kernel, the coal, and agriculture. I think our next president must have the courage to restructure our country. If we are to survive politically and economically, a central police can no longer police our country. 
What else needs to be done for us to realize that it is not working? If we decentralize the Nigerian police force today, the policing of this country will be better, more effective, more efficient. What are we waiting for? We have to go to the crux of our foundation. This foundation is not working. It's not working. And it's going to be worse in the future. A centralized government in a federation is an abnormality. There's no way it can work. Therefore, we must have the courage to say, this is not working for us. What else can we do? We had something that worked in the past. Can't we go back to something near to that? If you see, look, take a look at the proven mineral resources in each state of Nigeria. And this does not address agriculture. This does not address human capital. Take a look and tell me if the different sections of this country were concentrating in maximizing what God has given to them, each of the sections will be richer than at least 50% of countries in Africa. The structure is faulty and needs to be rejigged. Well, I don't want to go into the, the, the promises that were made by uh, APC and the inability of our president to, to, to implement those, 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 those promises. But even if you ask me to take just one shot, I will tell you, yes, President Muhammad Buhari means well. But probably the things that we needed for him to have to grow up country, we miscalculated. But what still, the team that he brought on board to help him to work. Because if you have a, a president that has capacity and he has shortfalls here and there, if he has assembled a crack team, those faults will not even be noticed. Well, sir, we have just a minute to go. So we need... Okay, sorry, Ruben. Yeah, we have just a minute to go, and I wanted to ask you, because you emphasize education, and yesterday on this program we were talking about minimum educational qualification for those who seek public offices. And we were told that the House of Reps is saying Section 131, Subsection D, must be amended that the minimum that anybody, wherever he or she may come from, should have is a degree, not secondary school or its equivalent. What do you think? Quickly. Well, we have seen what lack of education has done in our political landscape. Are we ready to continue with this? You have people sitting in parliament that cannot make a simple sentence correct in English. And they are going to interface with the rest of the world. If that constitution was right 20, 30 years ago, definitely it is not right today. The world has gone e-technology. The fourth industrial revolution we are into right now has no place for illiteracy. I even consider myself an illiterate when it comes to ICT. Because that's where the world is. We need to catch up. We can't catch up with illiterates. Okay. We have to catch up with enlightened people. Well, thank you. So education is critical in choosing who leads us. He must have current 
international capacity. Well, on that note, we'd like to thank you. On that note, we'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Wodo, uh, for joining us on the morning show today. Thank you very much. Thank you.